Good morning. In this session, we will discuss how files can be introduced. As I mentioned earlier today, files are often either not handled or are handled in a very rudimentary fashion. In fact, the students get to understand the files primarily from the operating system environment point of view that the files have names and the files are stored inside this and they are an array of bytes and so on and the only way they normally handle files is through redirection and that to only text files. The direct access files are rarely talked about in the first course. I suggest that this situation should be corrected while the due emphasis has to be given to handling of text files but at least some introduction to handling direct access files must be provided in the first course. Before we discuss the files, structures need to be understood because we are going to deal with structured data particularly in the context of handling information uh, and information processing problems. We will then review the files very quickly. Uh, first the simple files which we understand and then after discussing the sequential files, we will have a brief introduction to the direct access files which are actually called binary files. This is a simple introduction that we often need to access uh, different pieces of information related to the same entity and therefore to access and process such pieces we need to put these pieces together and treat them as a single entity. For example, roll number, name, let us say a batch, a laboratory batch or a tutorial batch and marks are attributes of a student and we would like to put them together and treat them as one single piece of information connected with a student. The notion of records in a text file, suppose I have created a text file which contains a roll number, name, lab batch and marks. I put them one after other separated by a blank space. Please note that it is always easy for us to say I can read this line and I can read the roll number in one variable, the name in another array, the lab batch in still another variable and marks in still another variable. If I want to read all of these, I can have an array of roll numbers, an array of marks, an array of lab batches and an array of arrays which contain all the string names, all of these. If I put Mr. Anil in 0th element of an array, then this roll number will be kept in the 0th element of the corresponding array and so on. However, I am clearly dealing with four distinct entities and the fact that one particular element of all these four entities represent a single piece of information about one student is not very obvious to the reader of the program. It is here that we feel the need for the notion of a structure. First, we explain the notion of files, records and fields. These terms come from the data processing industry, but these as I said are relevant increasingly for all branches of science and technology who do programming, because they do handle such records, fields uh, and files. Let us consider this text file which I just showed. It contains students data. Each line contains a record for one student and each record has values of several attributes, roll number, name, batch and marks. These are called fields of a record. In fact, roll number, name, batch, marks, these names are actually treated as metadata or data about data. They represent columns in a table where the rows in a table represent the values pertaining to a particular student. So in short then, several fields make a record and several records make a file. Each record in this file has information of the same attributes, roll number, name, batch and mark. So different records in the file will not have a different pieces of information or the information arranged in any haphazard order. 
in any record, the first field will be roll number, next will be name, next will be batch, next will be marks. The name string can have different length for different students depending upon the actual name that you get. So here is a pictorial representation again. This column is roll number, this column is name, this column is batch, this column is marks. But this row is the record number zero representing the record of student Anil. The next row or line number one is the record of the student called Amit and so on. There is no method that we know so far because we have not introduced to our students the notion of struct. There is no method by which we can consider a record as a single entity. It is our endeavor to ensure that we use the C, C++ programming facilities to represent a record per se and are able to describe the components of this record which are roll number, name, batch and marks. Notice that in a text file all the information is stored in the form of plain text. But internally I would most probably treat roll number as an integer number, batch as another integer number, marks as a floating point number and name as a character array. So I have to make a motley crowd of these four disparate things and somehow ensure that all the four elements of information about a student are made part of a single record. This single record kind of concept is nothing but a structure or struct in C. Struct is useful in representing entities which may have many attributes of distinct types. So as I said, we wish to represent and handle some basic information about a student like role, name, hostel, and room. We can define an abstract data type comprising these fields. The way we define it is, we say, for example, student info is the name we give to this abstract data type. We say struct, meaning student info is now being defined as a new type, which is of the type of a structure, as signified by the word struct. And inside the brasses, we write various components of the structure. For example, the first component is a roll number, so we say int roll. The next component is a character string representing name, so we say char name 30. The third component is batch, which is an integer value. The fourth component is a floating point variable called marks. Notice that ordinarily these are all disparate different things, but when put in this fashion, these four elements constitute a struct type called student info. Once we define this, remember this is an abstract data type. So like int or float or char, I can actually define variables of the type student struct student info. So variables can now be defined of this type and then they can be used. So let us see how do we do that. We say struct student info s. This is very similar to our saying float x or int y. When we say float x, it means x is a variable which is of the type float. When we say struct student info s, it means s is a variable of the type struct student info. That means s immediately represents an entity, a variable which has four components. The roll number, the name, the batch number and marks. How do we deal with individual components of S? Because it is the components which will have distinct values. We will have to assign values to these components. We may want to print those values or output those values. We may want to manipulate those values. We need to be able to therefore access and manipulate the components. This is possible because S is now called the structured variable. Its components are denoted by putting a dot between the name of that variable and the name of the component. So s dot roll becomes the roll number of this variable structure s. Its value will be integer because the first component was defined as integer. s dot name is an array which will hold the name of the school. s dot batch is again an integer value. s dot marks is a floating point value. It is therefore this s which is a variable of the struct type which actually is building a motley crowd of these four people as a single entity. And just like any other type, the struct student info also has a size. Now what is the size? The size is equal to the total number of bytes allocated to a variable of this type, which will be essentially the sum total ordinarily 
of the bytes required for individual components. How do we find the size? There is a function available in C++ which says size of struct student info. So you actually name the type inside. Just like you can say size of int, size of float. Notice that int might have different representations on different machines. Somewhere it might be 2 bytes, somewhere it might be 4 bytes. So when you say size of int, it actually gives you an output which is a number which says so many bytes constitute an integer type. Similarly, when you say size of struct info, it will actually give you the size in number of bytes. In this case, the size is 44 bytes. I have raised the question why. To understand why I am raising this question, let us go back briefly and see what the structure is. It has int role. We understand that integer is ordinarily 4 bytes. It has char name 30. This is 30 bytes. Int batch is 4 bytes and float marks is 4 bytes. Unfortunately, when we add up these component lengths, this is 4 bytes plus 4 bytes plus 4 bytes, 12 bytes, and this character array 30 is 30 bytes. The total should be 42. However, if I say size of, I will get 44. The reason is that in most of the computers, while elements of a structure will be given consecutive memory allocation, the allocation to individual components is made as per certain rules. And the simple rule is that on most machines, the beginning address of a location for a particular type of variable is often aligned on what is known as a word boundary. That means a variable location address will begin at 4 byte distance from the previous location. Now if you go back to this particular thing, let us consider this here. The role is 4 bytes. Char name is 30 bytes. But 30 plus 4 is 34. It is not divisible by 4. So 35 cannot be the starting address of this batch. The batch must start at an address which is divisible by 4. So there are 2 bytes which are lost in between. Nothing is kept in those 2 bytes. Those 2 bytes are sort of alignment bytes. And therefore the batch starts 2 bytes later. Mark starts of course 4 bytes because this is already aligned on the boundary. Consequently the total size is not 44 bytes, uh, 42 bytes but 44 bytes. Here is a program to calculate the rec size as I said. I define this structure, define a variable called s for this structure. I define an integer variable called rec size and I execute this statement. Size of any data type will give me the size of that data type. So structure, struct student info being a data type, this will give me the size of that data. Before going further, I'm going to write a program which actually reads the data for students and prints it out. It reads the data from a file, we'll introduce file shortly. However, we propose that we read this data in different elements of a structure. And then when we want, we want to print the value of a particular variable which is a structure variable. So consider this function which says print student. The parameter that is passed to this function is not individually roll number, name, batch and mark, but a structure variable is passed. So just like we say int x as a parameter here, we'll say struct student info s. So the variable passed is s which is actually a structure. And inside if we use printf, or C out statement, we will not use role name, etc. We'll say s dot role, s dot name, s dot batch, and s dot mark. This will print the four components of the a, a particular student whose information is passed through this variable s, which is of the struct student info type. It is at this stage that we introduce the notion of a file. First of all, Whatever listed on this slide is something which is already well known to the students. Namely, a file has a name, it has an extension such as .txt, uh, .exe, .tate, whatever, whatever. It has a path, it has permissions for reading and writing. The file has a size which is equal to the total number of bytes. This is in the information which generally students would already know. The physical location of a file and its properties are known to the operating system because it is the operating system which is the custodian of all files. Now, 
as far as C++ is concerned, it treats a file as a large array of bytes. It is very important, interesting and important to note that as far as C++ is concerned, whatever type of file you talk about, for it a file is an array of bytes. That array has a name which is a file name. File name is a peculiar entity which is a pointer, I will explain that. But C++ treat the file as a large array of bytes. Now these bytes may contain character data, in which case it is a text file, or they may contain an encoded data, in which case they are called binary files. Consider for example, if we wish to push the internally stored information about a struct S to a file. Now struct S does have text component, it has name which is text. However, the roll number is an int, the marks are float, and all these information represent internally as per a floating point format or whatever constitute a series of bytes. Those many bytes is the size of a record which will occupy when I push a, a particular value of s onto a file. We can also use the facility of files to store special digitized data such as voice of images. We already know that image data can be stored in this fashion. The files are handled in a very peculiar fashion in a program. Unlike other variables and arrays which have a name that we give, files are always handled through a pointer. So what you, whenever you want to use a file, you declare not a file name, but a name which points to a file. The keyword FILE written in capital is almost like any other type like uh, int or float, but it is a pointer type. So just like we say int star, you say file star p file star in file, file star out file. We use appropriate names to indicate a file from which we will read data in, so it is called in file. A file on which we will write data out, so called out file. Of course, any arbitrary name can be used by us. Now a file can be opened, records can then be read or written to that file. And at the end, it should be closed. In short, conceptually a file is like a cupboard. There are multiple cupboards available. You name a cupboard by your name. In your program, when you say open that file, it means open that cupboard. Once a cupboard is open, you can read data from various components of that cupboard. You can write data to various components of that cupboard. And what are the components? These are merely a sequence of locations, which is an array of bytes. The read-write operations are done through special functions. There is an internal index which says at which location we are at the moment where read or write will take place. These internal indexes automatically incremented after each operation in case where the file is opened for sequential read or write. All text files by definition are opened for sequential access only. That means although I compared a file with a cupboard, when a cupboard contains a text file and the cupboard has many locations, I cannot arbitrarily go to any location there. I have to sequentially go through all the locations one by one, read or write them, and then close the file. However, a file which is not a sequential type can permit me to go to any particular portion of the, of the cupboard. I will explain that through a brief di a small diagram very soon. This slide describes what is meant by the direct access of records to a file. As I said, a file is a series of bytes, it is an array of bytes. Relatively independent of where the file is located on the desk, as far as our program is concerned, whenever we open a file, we presumably are at this point, which is the 0th byte of the file. This is the first byte, this is the second byte, this is the third byte and so on. Now how do we know in case of a sequential access or for that matter at any point in time, where are we pointing to in the file? This is done by a position value. So we can go to a position and access any number of bytes from that position. That is the essence of direct access. Imagine a thing called pos, a variable called pos, 
which is a numerical value, the first value points maybe to the current position where we are. We can change the value of pulse and use it appropriately in the this functions and this pointer could point to any boy. Do not confuse this index with the name of the file. The name of the file represents this entire entity. There are special functions available in C++ which permit us to go anywhere. For example, I can use a function called fseek which sets the position indicated by pos for accessing the file. Please remember that pos is actually invisible to the actual functions which read or write data. I have to set the position appropriately through fseek function before doing any read or write for directly access file. The pos represents the displacement value which is specified relative to either file beginning which is represented by something called seek set. This is actually a, a predefined value. These values are 0, 1 or 2 for seek set, seek curve and seek end. I will explain very briefly how exactly these are used through an example. The functions f read and f write read and write specified by at that position. So the position has to be set independently using f seek. Once the position is set, whenever I say f read, the bytes will be read from that position and whenever I say f write, the bytes will be written at that position. After reading or reading so many bytes as prescribed, the internal position is automatically advanced by the number of bytes which I have read or which I have written. These are the functions for handling files which we call the direct access files or sequential access files. For example, f open. This command opens a file and it requires the file pointer as a parameter. So if I declare file star fp, then a statement of the type fp is equal to f open followed by parameters which are prescribed as part of f open. These parameters are the name of the file which is known to the operating system and the mode in which the file is open. R for example means I want to read from data from that file. How do we know that this is executed properly? It depends upon whether after executing this statement fp gets allocated a value which is a proper pointer value. If for some reason this opening business fails and operating system throws up the hand saying I can't open this file, fp is set to null. It is invariably a good practice after opening a file to examine whether the file was indeed opened or not by just checking the value of fp. This is shown here in case of another file which is described here, file star fp out. The name suggests that this file is going to be an output file. That means I am going to write something on it. Observe the way the file is opened. fp out equal to f open db dot bin rb. Now this is the name of the file dot bin extension means it is a binary file. rb means it is for reading. It is open for reading. So somebody has already written the data there. b means it is a binary file. It means it can be directly accessed. Here again the fp out, the pointer may or may not have proper value depending upon whether open succeeded or not. And I can say if fp out equal equals null, then I say cannot open output file. Notice the dichotomy here. I think many of you would have noticed that these lines are not written correctly. Even though you may not know the exact syntax of fp out and fp, you should be able to spot the error. Those of you who are not able to immediately do that, please go in the evening in your labs and in the lab you have a lab handout wherein many programs containing these statements are there and then cross check what is the correct syntax uh, for use. Here is a typical reading process for a file. Read record number k from a binary file. At this stage, let me revert back to the notepad. So this is the disk. My files will ordinarily reside somewhere here. 
So let us say this is a file called student.bin. When I say open the file, the file will be opened and a file pointer will be associated with it. So I will use the f open statement and I will assign it to some file pointer which I have defined, let us say fp. When I open the file, the file will open to me something like this. This is that array. And there are bytes here. And so on. Notice that I, although I can read and write single byte, that is not the objective. I would like to read or write a group of bytes. I would like to read or write a record. For example, let us say these many bytes constitute a record. Then I would like to read the group of bytes like this, as many records as I have. Let's say this is record 0, this is record 1, this is record 2, and so on. Each record has a fixed size. Now you can relate this to the notion of struct, because the struct size is actually the size of a record which I would like to read or write from a file. Ordinarily, as I told you about the position, when I open the file, my position is actually located here. As I read or write, this position changes. As I said, it's a hidden position. But I can use the command fseek to set the position anywhere here I want. I can set it arbitrarily to 1,000 bytes. It will go here. Uh, to, to, to the 1,000 bytes, 1 millionth byte, it will go somewhere here. Of course, I would like to position it in the context of the records that I have. So what I will do, supposing this is record which has the length 44 bytes, and I want to position it at this record. So 44 plus 44 is 88, and I should then position this, 0th position is this first byte of this record, so 88 will be the position here. I can calculate that using this struct. How do I set the value of position, which as I said is pos. First and foremost, pos is defined as a large int, so it, it actually can represent a very large value. It is in this context, so what I will ordinarily do is, I will first set pos to something, then I will f seek to that position. Just by giving a value to the variable pos does not mean that my internal position of the file has changed anywhere. The position indicator remains wherever it is. Pos is merely my notion of a name of a variable where I want to put a value. After I put the value, it is f seek function which will move this position to that position, move this pointer to that position. And after I do this, I can do either f read or f right. In the context of this explanation, just see this small sample few lines written here. To read record number k from a binary file, I define long int pos. Then I open the file. I presume that I have defined the file to be file pointer to be fp. I say f open fp file name dot bin comma rb. As I told you, after opening the file, I should check whether the file indeed opened or not. Now suppose I want to read the kth record of the file. I am calculating pos as equal to k minus 1 into the record size. So k minus 1 are the previous records. Since first position is 0, second is 0 plus record size, third is 0 plus 2 record size and so on. So k minus 1 into record size will point to the kth record. What is this rec underscore size? You recall that rec size is what I calculated by, from my structure. Okay. All that, I have not positioned the file. 
I have merely calculated the value of an internal variable which is known only to me. The file system has nothing to do with this variable pos. Only in my mind, I think that this denotes the position of the internal uh, pointer to the file. After calculating this, I use the word fc. fc, fp, comma, pos, comma, seek underscore set means seek underscore state means starting point of the file. From the starting point, calculate so many bytes and set the internal uh, indicator or internal pointer or internal index to that position. Now the file is positioned for me to read or write a record at that place. Since this file is open as a read file, I cannot write anything. But I say f read. Now observe the parameters of f read and s. This is a pointer to the structure variable whose record value I want to read. Rec underscore size. This gives me the size of the record or so many bytes I want to read. One, it gives me the number of units of this record I need to read. What does it mean? I can read 10 records at a time if I want. The total number of bytes read will be the number I write here multiplied by the rec size. Of course, in that case, I should have an array of structs as this parameter. I will still pass the parameter as pointer to the 0th element of the array. In this particular case, I will read only one record. And the file pointer from which I have to read the file is actually the last parameter of this function. So f read and s rec size comma 1 comma fp will read from this file from wherever the position is currently at the file, which I have set by the f6 statement, it will read so many bytes and it will pass on those many bytes to the structure variable s. Notice that this way I can read or write arbitrarily at any position in the file. This is called the direct access file. There are two examples which I have given in, in the handout. These are the two problems which that those examples solve. The first problem says, read records from a text file, extract the four component values from each record. Which are these four component values? The same which we described earlier. Roll number, name, batch number, and marks of a student. And there are multiple students listed in that file. In fact, the same data is given as a sample input file in the uh, handout. So read those records from a text file, assign these to appropriate parts of a structure and create a binary file called studentdb.bin. DB generally stands for database. In fact, those of our students who will study databases later will understand much more about these direct access files. Dot .bin is not obligatory. I need not give an extension. It's like any arbitrary name that I choose. It is customary to write dot .bin as an extension for binary files. But as I said, it is absolutely not essential. So this is the first problem. Read the data. The data reading from the text file is done as if I am reading it sequentially. Every time I read a record, I should create a struct record and push it into the binary file. This is the first problem. Having created this, now I, let us say, want to search for information about a student. I give a roll number and I want to write a program given that roll number, it will search and get extract information only about that student. One, I can read the file sequentially record after record. I want to find the marks of a student given the roll number. So the first part is sequential search on disk file. The program that has been given as a sample program actually contains instructions to do that. Second, read a student record at specified position by direct access and update or modify the marks and rewrite the modified records and verify. Now this is interesting. There are records and by the way in actual practice for example consider all students who take the joint entrance exam. There are 4 lakh students. So there are 4 lakh records on the disk. Now consider you want to find out the marks of a particular student. You have a choice of sequentially reading all the records of a file. On the other hand, if you know 
what is the record number for that student you can directly position the internal pointer to that point and read a record minimal time spent the disk is capable of giving you directly that information this direct access makes the access extremely fast okay so the second point says read a student record at a specified position by direct access not only you read the record but after reading the record you want to update the marks let's say somebody said look you have given me 91 marks but actually i got 93.5 whatever so you say all right i have verified everything now how do i change that remember the data is already written on the desk i can then open a file in what is known as a read write mode that mode permits you to update information in place so you read a record and you rewrite the record in the same position there are some interesting figures for example when i read a record the read the very read operation will actually shift the internal pointer by as many bytes as the record that i have read so before i rewrite i have to bring back that position by another fc to this place and then rewrite there is an additional problem i can access individual records by giving the record number but i have to access the records because i am given only the roll number how do i know which roll number is in which record that means i will require a mapping from roll number to record number this is an entirely independent field in itself in fact the notion of index files and the notion of creating indexes is related precisely to this kind of correlation or mapping given a roll number find its record number and we don't want to do that by reading all the records and saying ah this roll number is found so the record number is whatever 154 that beats the purpose because i want to directly access 154th record so the mechanism of this mapping has to be outside the file itself which contains all the data anyway this is the marks data.txt file this file has been included in your handout so this file will be used automatically as an input file by the first program which will create the binary file here is a sample program in a more visible fashion the handout is small page so you may not be able to read everything reading records from a text file and writing to a binary file notice this i have not given the declarations and so on but it starts with int count equal to 0 it does an f scan f from fp underscore input this is clearly the file pointer associated with the input file an input file is a text file none other than this file which contains this text so i would have opened i have to open it by giving the name marks data.txt and then read data from it so this is what it attempts to do it says f scan f scan f is the ordinary input function from keyboard f scan f says read from a file and the first parameter of f scan f is the file name or the file pointer so i say f scan f fp underscore input and the remaining statement is exactly the same statement that i would have used to get these various compounds remember this is a text file so i read this in terms of the parameters that i give because the number of blanks that i will put or the number of characters in a name will differ i do not know this is not a fixed length record yet this is a text file already after having read these components i want to construct a record so notice how i am doing it while the file has not ended i take the input that means the i have actually got a record therefore the input is valid i increment the count and now i do the interesting thing i assign the value of r which i have read from here and r to s dot rows b to s dot batch m to s dot marks and i copy the array that i have collected the name in n is obviously an array into s dot name so all the four components of my structure have been filled with values which i have just read for one student having read this i output that record i say count that is the first record second record whatever and i say print student in bracket s what is print student you remember we had written a function print student so it invokes that function 
takes s as the parameter which is the structure to which values have been assigned and this function will print the separate components of s having done this now i create a record i write the record in the binary file see how it is written f right and s comma rec size comma 1 fp underscore output that means in the file pointed to by fp output whatever is the current position you write one record of the size rec size and from where from a structure which is pointed to by the address and s so very simple i have constructed a record inside my memory and i am writing it onto the file please note that as i said every read and write operation automatically advances the internal uh, position pointer or position indicator so when i read the next record from the text file and go back to execute this iteration again the second record will be extracted it will be written and so on at the end all records which were there in the text file will now be written inside the difference is what i read were text values as text input but what i am writing is a composite structure role is a integer binary number batch is an integer binary number marks is an integer floating point value and name is a string array but all these composite form a record of the size rec size which is written here in exactly a similar fashion i can read these records sequentially i have already suggested how direct access can be made let us very briefly look at uh, the uh, file handout the first page of this handout tells you about the standard library functions which are stored in cstdio those of you who are familiar with the standard c programming would remember saying hash include stdio.h the header files which were to be included through compiler directives always had .h suffix in the traditional way however in c++ if you want to use those header files which belong to c type functions then the names are different the library name is simply cstdio this contains a very rich set of library functions which permit you to do variety of things as i mentioned here i just want you to show the names of the functions so that you can read them f open for example this opens a file what i have done is i have consolidated the name of a function an example of using that function in a program and then describe what those parameters mean for example if the mode is r it means read w means write a means append text file is the default if you want a binary file you have to say b all that is written here it returns a pointer of type file and it returns null if the file cannot be opened i am sorry i can't show you the entire document but please at leisure read this uh, thing it is on the moodle so even after you go back you can access the moodle download this handout and read it of course i urge you to read from standard textbooks sadly professor abhiram ranade in his book on c++ does not spend too much time on files but there are several other books and most importantly the c++ open tutorial on the internet will it is an open access tutorial and you'll get all the information that you need what i have tried to do is to put concise information here along with some examples you should be able to download this print it and read it at leisure here my attempt is only to show uh, what kind of uh, functions you have so you have f open f close remember whenever you open a cupboard at the end of your job you must close it properly exactly the same way with files of course c++ is very decent if you forget to close a file and get out of your program at the end of the program normally c++ closes your file here is the fseek function which i just mentioned so it says fseek fp comma pos comma origin origin means with respect to what point you are describing the pos that is where the seek curve seek set etc occur you can read more details about it f tell is a very interesting function you are in the midst of the program and you have forgotten at which particular point in the file 
you currently are. Remember, the file knows where the current position is, but that is invisible to us. And we have forgotten how we had calculated POS and used FC earlier and so on. All that I can say, I use this function FTEL. FTEL FP will return the current position. So I know what is the current position which I can assign to POS. So these are interesting functions that are given. A rewind will bring the position back to zero. F read and F write are the two functions which read and write uh, records the binary file. The normal standard functions that you have, get s or get line or get c, etc., etc., are available in this library so that you can handle the text which comes from a file instead of being typed on the keyboard. fscanf and fprintf are the file related functions of scanf and printf. As I said, scanf will work on keyboard input, printf will produce an output on your screen. But fscanf and fprintf will read and write respectively on text file. Here is a program which creates the binary file. By the way, this is a PDF file, but my colleague Nagesh Karmali has also inserted these individual files as .cpp text file. So when you download and untar or unzip the bundle, you will get not only the PDF file with this handout, but you will also get two CPP programs, one which creates the file and another which actually reads a specified roll numbers record and so on. And you also have a data file which is the text file. So you don't have to type in either the program or the data. Just explore it, run it and have fun. You will see how binary files work. I urge you to do that today because this is not ordinarily what you would be doing. Very rarely I have seen students and teachers dealing with direct access files. Surely it is less important than variety of other important concepts which must be well understood by students. But it is so important in later life and particularly for students of non-computer science and non-CS who will hardly be handling files in their programming. It is useful to give them some indication on how to use this. I think I will now use the remaining 10 minutes for some interaction. This is MPSTME at Dhule. Hello, good morning, sir. Sir, my first question is, what data types we have to use if a value exceeds 18 digits? You have no data type. You have to write special package, which we say is a high precision arithmetic package. In fact, that is a major limitation. And whatever number, suppose, there is a compiler which permits whatever 80 digit kind of value, then I will ask you, what do I do if I have 85 digits? What do I do if I have 120 digits? The limitations are very well known, well established. In fact, that is a major part of study of all your numerical analysis work because of the limited precision. Uh, in the CS101X course, which I will conduct, and which, I, as I suggested, you and your students are welcome to register for it as audit students. I have a session in which I describe how high precision numbers, large precision numbers can be represented and how simple arithmetic can be performed on such high precision numbers. But within the C, C++, there is no facility for representing this. This is Silguri Institute of Technology. Hello, sir. Good afternoon. Sir, I, have having, I am having the question that uh, last session you have discussed that we are having one structure and it's having the content int roll care name and array size is the 30 int batch float marks and you are telling that that if we write the C out uh, size of student info then it will give the result 44 byte yes. but I think if we give the C out size of student info, it will not give the 44 byte. It will give the original size 42. But originally, when we will store some record in this structure, that time it will take the 44 byte. Just now, I have executed this program also. And I have seen that in my uh, system, I have executed that one in TC in 4.5. And they are, it was giving the result 38 byte. Why 38 byte? Because in this case, it's taking the roll and batch 
two two byte so two plus two four byte and in the for name it's taking the thirty byte so thirty plus four thirty four and marks it's taking the four byte total thirty eight byte and it's showing the answer also thirty eight byte. I got your question. You forgot one thing. You forgot to tell us your name. Kumbha Energy. Okay. So very nice to speak to someone so far away from us physically. Thank you for a good question. Let me answer this. What our friend is saying is very interesting. Suppose I have something called int a float b int c. Now when I discuss these things in the context of my sample program, I had assumed that int a require four bytes. Int C requires four bytes. Float B requires four bytes. In her system, Int A requires two bytes. Int C requires two bytes. Float is probably four bytes. So this is system one. And this is system two. I can assure you, my dear lady from Siliguri, that you will, it is not impossible to find a very high end supercomputer which the C compiler implementation is such that integer is 8 bytes, floating point is 64 bytes, and this integer is 8 bytes. This would be system 3. And that is the whole point. These lengths, these allocations, are compiler dependent and machine dependent. They are not uniform. And that is the reason why what you use on your machine is best reflected by writing the command, writing the function. Whatever you want to know, you should find out from your system only. Your system knows what is the size of int, what is the size of float, what is the size of int. And I thank you for asking this question because it gave me a chance to emphasize that different computers and different compilers working on those computers will allocate different sizes for the same type of data. But whatever type of data and whatever is the allocation that is done on your machine, that is what the implementation of size of will return to you. So if you say size of struct whatever and calculate it into, let us say, size. Now, this variable value, in my case, it was coming 44. In your case, it is coming 36. When you claim that it will come 42 and not 44, you are basing your observation on the assumption that I do not require to align things on a 4-byte boundary. Please understand that on your machine, the boundary is 2 bytes. Try to allocate an odd number of elements of the array and put that array of characters in between two integer values, you will suddenly find that it will not measure up exactly equal to 2 plus 2 plus, let's say, 29 bytes or something like that. There is an alignment which is usually forced on numerical types. However, the point is that these allocations, including the allocations within the, for the components of a structure, are entirely dependent on compiler and machine. So we cannot generalize. Let's take a couple of more questions. Thank you for this good question. My name is Kirtika from PMC Tech, Ozur. Yeah, please Sir, ask as we that. know that uh, the C and C++ both can run in C GCC compiler and also the Turbo C compiler, so, but it varies in header files. And also some of the codes regarding the pointers uh, it gives various results in uh, C GCC compiler and Turbo C compiler. Actually, our uh, we have for the second year student itself the C and C++. How the students can give, get the impact of this difference? Please, can you explain this? Again, a good question, but very much similar. The answer is very much similar to what our friend from Siliguri asked. The pointers point to internal addresses. And therefore, these internal addresses depend upon how the memory allocation is done to different variables of the different types. 
This itself is compiler dependent. I mentioned that it may be machine dependent, that is one factor, but it is also compiler dependent. On the same machine, you use GCC compiler, you will get one set of values. On the same machine, if you use Turbo compiler, you are likely to get different kinds of values. Unfortunately, C++ language officially permits this. It says these sizes and therefore the memory allocated pointers, etc., etc., are implementation dependent. That means the, either the machine or the compiler, if they are different, then you will get different results. But I will tell you what you should tell your students is they should not worry about this. As long as the calculations are concerned, as long as the control flow is concerned, C, C++ will behave exactly in a similar fashion. The problem will come if you create binary files at one place and try to read them at other place and if the binary file sizes are not same, then you will have problems. It is for this reason that often the components also are defined as text components and you actually write ASCII code for the numerical value just like you put in the text. The only thing is you don't permit variable size strings. However, you create a binary file, you read and write a binary file, but you ensure that the record size of that file is fixed across all machines and compilers. And that way, for that, you have to force the size. You can't depend upon the size determined by various components. But as far as individual machines are concerned, if you are creating local struct variables or local struct arrays, which exist only for the duration of your program execution, there is no problem. It will not affect the result. But yes, these things are, are compiler dependent and implementation dependent. Uh, my name is Amit Hiravat, sir. Uh, sir, I, am, uh, I wanted to know about uh, dangling pointers and uh, the precautions we should take uh, to avoid dangling pointers. Uh, dangling pointers generally refer to a pointer which does not point to anything. This can happen generally if you assign to a pointer an arbitrary absolute value yourself without getting the pointer through the address operation. This can also happen if you have defined a pointer variable and if you are using some advanced features of the programming language such as memory allocation. Now when a new memory is allocated to a structure or a variable, it is brought into existence by the compiler at runtime, and the memory is actually allocated at that point. Now imagine if you have done that and you have assigned the pointer to that through some address operation to some pointer P. Now later on in your program, you destroy that object or you, you deallocate the memory. Now that object is gone. That memory is reallocated by the runtime system to something else. But the pointer variable in your program in which you had extracted that old mem memory address is still holding that value. Now that si suddenly that pointer becomes pointing to nowhere. Or in fact it might be pointing to another new object which your program has created later which is all wrong. What is important how to handle these dangling pointers is to ensure that whenever you deallocate memory which your program has allocated, all the corresponding pointer variables or arrays which you have used in your program and to which values have been assigned pertaining to these objects should not be used unless they are reassigned values. In short, in your code segment, you should always ensure that a pointer variable is used very close physically to a place where the pointer variable is assigned a value. You cannot assign a value to a pointer variable thousand lines before and use it some time later. You should be able to aware where it is. So that is one precaution. Second is a pointer which has a null value, you should be extremely careful about. Null pointers are the pointers which cause maximum havoc in programming. Uh, sir, if we write a statement like int star int star s equal to some string int pointer s equal to some string in double quotes. Now that s is uh, the s initially contains a, a garbage value. So is it that the string is uh, stored at a garbage location? 
No, I would like to ask him more fundamental question. Why would you do such a silly thing at all in the first place? No, but if you want to string, store a string into a pointer, character pointer s is equal to a string. Character pointer s equal to string. Okay. Now, the the string is stored. The first character of the string is stored in the uh, location s. The question is. Uh, is S uh, a, a uh, garbage value? No. Uh, okay, I get what you are trying to say. I think there are many other colleagues who are also wondering what you are trying to say. I would suggest the following. I would say that the pointer variables should always be used in the context of other variables and arrays and not in the context of constants. Constants are known as constants. Let them be known as constants. I do not see any reason to necessarily get a pointer to a constant. I don't see any programmatic use of it. However, it is interesting to do a small experiment on the machine and check what happens. I have already indicated in that sample program that you can print pointer values and you can see whether they make any sense or not. And you can get also what pointer points to. But the fundamental programming decency is in ensuring that when and if I use pointers, they are obtained values for only through the address operation on some variables and the array, not by direct assignment. KIT College of Engineering. Sir, so my question is regarding the pointers. Sir, what is the difference between Car star and unsigned car star. Well, I'll tell you, I, 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 I'm not absolutely very sure because in my mind both should point to the same thing. If you talk about different types, say I will give you an example, int and long end or float and double. These have different number of bytes allocated to them. And therefore that pointer, when you define, See, the purpose of defining a pointer of a particular type is that when you do a pointer arithmetic operation, add one or subtract one, it should actually move forward or backward by so many bytes. The only difference between uh, char star and unsigned char star, uh, I do not know. It still occurs to me that both char and unsigned char should occupy the same number of bytes in terms of numerical values, but internally, if the type is distinguished, then you can use the char star pointer only in the context of char variables, and you can use unsigned char star pointer only in the case of unsigned char variables. In general, I have seen unsigned char being used to represent pixel values in images. But whatever it is, the type is associated with a pointer permanently. And whenever you are using that pointer, you must use it in the context of that variable only. I'll also try to find out more about this. So myself, Samir Patil. In uh, Linux environment, as the pointers deal with the logical or the virtual addresses, how could be dangerous to deal with the pointers? It's many times been say, suggested that the pointers may raise the security concerns. But in Linux environment, they are dealing with the virtual addresses. Why they could raise a security reason? Thank you. A, a, a pointer inside our program does not deal with a virtual address. A pointer inside our program relates always to a concrete object which has been created in the memory. It becomes virtual only because you might make a mistake of the kind that I mentioned, that you have, you have allocated memory to something, then extracted its address and allocated to a pointer, and then you have deallocated that memory. That is when the pointer becomes virtual. But otherwise, if you are careful, there is absolutely no problem. The, the notion of a security risk is not created by the fact that there are pointers in the programming language. It is created by the wrong use of pointers. So do not blame a programming language feature for the security breach. <laughs> okay? It's our inability to control our program. Uh, my friends incidentally just mentioned that in so far as storage is concerned, both unsigned care and 
uh, unsigned uh, char star and char star will still have four bytes of memory except that uh, the distinction is only that you can use one pointer only in the context of that particular type. Uh, frankly, we do not know if there is any more difference, but we'll find out. We'll take two more uh, questions again. Uh, we're going to the Selvam College of Technology. Good afternoon, sir. I am Raj Narayan, sir. Uh, my question is uh, regarding uh, pointers. So I want to know how should the null uh, be defined on the machine uh, use as a, a non-zero bit pattern representing the null pointer. This is now my question number one, sir. Uh, I would be highly surprised if a null pointer any, in any implementation uses a non-zero representation. I have not come across this. By definition, null is an absolute zero. Any other value will symbolize uh, some specific value. I have not come across it. Uh, can you tell me where you came across a non-zero null pointer? In fact, the very word NULL capital means zero. So whenever you compare a pointer with null, it's actually being compared with an absolute zero value. Is there some place where you come across a non-zero value? Over to you. Uh, this is a question actually arised by my student. Uh, when he uh, attended some interview, he asked this question to me. Oh, okay, okay. So just I want to clarify that with yeah, you yeah. now. Okay, good, good. Uh, so the right answer to, my, to the best of my knowledge is that there is no such thing as a non-zero null pointer. A null is always a null and if a pointer contains any non-zero value, it is not null. It may not be meaningful, it may be a dangling pointer as our friend said, but a null pointer is a null pointer always. We will go to, thank you so much, we will go to one more institution. Uh, my name is Suma from St. Joseph's College of Engineering. I have two doubts. One is regarding the strings, uh, which I plan to ask in the previous section. Uh, that is, um, in Turbo C, sometimes when we use get us command, get us function, uh, the function will not work. Usually, the statement will be skipped and it will uh, take the next line onwards. Why this happens? Uh, I have no idea how that function works anymore. Uh, my own uh, uh, example programs were created about three years ago. As of now, the behavior of getS is becoming increasingly funny and interesting. My recommendation is to avoid using that. Whenever you want to read a string, use getLine, which is now standard and recognized by everyone. Uh, but I will try to explore it. Unfortunately, we do not have a turbo environment, but it will be interesting to do that experiment and find out. Yeah, I, I, a friend of mine has an answer. Being an MTech student, I think he must have recently dealt with turbo. What he is telling us is that getS actually reads from the buffer. When you start the program, it assumes that there is an end of line, and that is what it might cause uh, to skip a, a, a line particular. So his suggestion is, you just say flush before saying get s. The flush function will flush the buffer and the next get s will work properly. I think that is, that is interesting and useful. So basically the problem is happening that the get s function in turbo environment is not necessarily always reading from std in or terminal or file, but it is reading from the buffer. So if you have some previously read thing, it might take the end of line from the previous buffer and skip the line. So I think his answer is correct that if you use flush command, the flush actually flushes the buffer out so that the get s will necessarily force yourself to go to the actual file. I suspect that even get line might have the same problem. If turbo has a habit of reading from uh, buffer, then it will implement everything the same way. I do not know. No. So he is also more confident about get line. The advice is use get right. Thank you. Anura group of institutions. Uh, good afternoon, sir. This is Balram from Anura group of institutions. Uh, regarding uh, uh, array's uh, previous session, in the morning session, I have a doubt. Uh, we declared a array uh, of size 10. Uh, when I take the input into the array, uh, 
maximum uh, increases uh, uh, up to the size uh, so uh, when i take the input uh, above the 10 uh, size of the array it will taking as a input so uh, how we can control this one uh, you 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 cannot control that uh, there are mechanisms by which you can define the maximum number of bytes to be read etc etc in case of file processing but otherwise the care has to be taken only by the input operation the standard trick is to define a much larger array as a temporary buffer internally inside your program read input into that array and then examine the contents yourself and transfer whatever string you have read to some other array but there is no other clean way automatically you cannot control that the, the C++ implementation expects you to take care all right we'll just take one more question oh, there is one more question from the same center all right please go ahead sir when i'm allocating the, uh, the memory allocation by using malloc so when i'm releasing the memory so simply we are passing only starting address of the location so how the memory or free can recognize this is the end of the uh, location for example i have allocated 10 uh, 20 bytes of memory so simply we are passing starting address but how it recognizes it is a 20 bytes up to that you are not passing a starting address you are passing a pointer and the pointer is associated with a type. The pointer remembers how many bytes were allocated. If you are passing an absolute address, what you say might happen. That's precisely the reason why pointers are used. So uh, you don't have to worry about it. I'm glad that you remember to deallocate memory. I have seen people who keep mallocking and never release it and get into lots of problems. Uh, but the answer is this that you are not actually passing an address you are passing a pointer and the pointer being associated with what you originally allocated it knows exactly what is the size of bytes that needs to be deallocated